The party was dull. I had come too early. There was a preview that night at Grauman's Chinese, and few of the important guests would arrive until it was over. Jack Hardy, ace director at Summit Pictures, where I worked as assistant director, hadn't arrived, yet, and he was the host, but Hardy had never been noted for punctuality. I went out on the porch and leaned against a railing and looked down at the lights of Hollywood. Hardy's place was on the summit of a hill overlooking the film capital, near Falcon Lair, Valentino's famous turreted castle. I shivered a little. Fog was sweeping in from Santa Monica, blotting out the lights to the west. Jean Hubbard, who was an ingenue at Summit, came up beside me and took the glass out of my hand. Hello, Mark, she said, sipping the liquor. Where have you been? Down with the murder desert troop, on location in the Mojave, I said. Miss me, honey? I drew her close. She smiled up at me, her tilted eyebrows lending a touch of the diabolical to the tanned, lovely face. I was going to marry Jean, but I wasn't sure just when. Missed you lots, she said, and held up her lips. I responded. After a moment, I said, what's this about the vampire man? She chuckled. Oh, the Chevalier Foutain. Didn't you read Lolly Parsons' write-up and script? Jack Hardy picked him up last month in Europe. Silly rot. Still, it's good publicity. Three cheers for publicity, I said. Look what it did for Birth of a Nation. But where does the vampire angle come in? Mystery man. Nobody can take a picture of him. Scarcely anybody can meet him. Weird tales are told about his former life in Paris. He's going to play in Red Thirst. The kind of build-up Universal gave Karloff for Frankenstein. Our Chevalier Foutain, she rolled out the words with amused relish, is probably a singing waiter from a Paris cafe. I haven't seen him, but the deuce with him anyway. Mark, I want you to do something for me. For Deming. Hess Deming? I raised my eyebrows in astonishment. Hess Deming, Summit's biggest box office star, whose wife, Sandra Coulter, had died two days before. She, too, had been an actress, although never the great star her husband was. Hess loved her, I knew, and now I guessed what the trouble was. I said, I noticed he was a bit wobbly. He'll kill himself, Jean said, looking worried. I feel responsible for him somehow, Mark. After all, he gave me my start at Summit, and he's due for the DTs any time now. Well, I'll do what I can, I told her, but that isn't a great deal. After all, getting tight is probably the best thing he could do. I know if I lost you, Jean. I stopped. I didn't like to think of it. Jean nodded. See what you can do for him anyway. Losing Sandra that way was pretty terrible. What way? I asked. I've been away, remember? I read something about it, but... She just died, Jean said. Pernicious anemia, they said, but Hess told me the doctor really didn't know what it was. She just seemed to grow weaker and weaker until she passed away. I nodded, gave Jean a hasty kiss, and went back into the house. I had just seen Hess Deming walk past, a glass in his hand. He turned as I tapped his shoulder. Oh, Mark, he said, his voice just a bit fuzzy. He could hold his liquor, but I could tell by his bloodshot eyes that he was almost at the end of his rope. He was a handsome devil, all right, well-built, strong-featured, with level gray eyes and a broad mouth that was usually smiling. It wasn't smiling now. It was slack, and his face was bedewed with perspiration. "'You know about Sandra?' he asked. "'Yeah,' I said. "'I'm sorry, Hess.' He drank deeply from the glass, wiped his mouth with a grimace of distaste. I'm drunk, Mark, he confided. I had to get drunk. It was awful, those last few days. I've got to burn her up. I didn't say anything. Burn her up? Oh my God, Mark, that beautiful body of hers, crumbling to ash, and I've got to watch it. She made me promise I'd watch to make sure they burned her. I said, cremation's a clean ending, Hess, and Sandra was a clean girl and a damned good actress. He put his flushed face close to mine. Yeah, but I've got to burn her up. It'll kill me, Mark. Oh, God. He put the empty glass down on a table and looked around dazedly. I was wondering why Sandra had insisted on cremation. She'd given an interview once in which she stressed her dread of fire. Most write-ups of stars are applesauce, but I happen to know that Sandra did dread fire. Once on the set, I'd seen her go into hysterics when her leading man lit his pipe too near her face. 
Excuse me, Mark, Hess said. I've got to get another drink. Wait a minute, I said, holding him. You want to watch yourself, Hess. You've had too much already. It still hurts, he said. Just a little more, and maybe it won't hurt so much. But he didn't pull away. Instead, he stared at me, with a dullness of intoxication in his eyes. Clean, he said, presently. She said that too, Mark. She said burning was a clean death. But God, that beautiful white body of hers. I can't stand it, Mark. I'm going crazy, I think. Get me a drink like a good fellow. I said, wait here, Hess, I'll get you one. I didn't add that it would be watered, considerably. He sank down in a chair, mumbling thanks. As I went off, I felt sick. I'd seen too many actors going on the rocks to mistake Hess's symptoms. I knew that his box office days were over. There would be longer and longer waits between features, and then personal appearances, and finally Poverty Row and serials. And in the end, maybe a man found dead in a cheap hall bedroom on Main Street, with the gas on. There was a crowd around the bar. Somebody said, Here's Mark. Hey, come on and meet the vampire. Then I got a shock. I saw Jack Hardy, my host, the director with whom I'd had many a hit. He looked like a corpse, and I'd seen him looking plenty poorly before. A man with a hangover or a marijuana jag isn't a pretty sight, but I'd never seen Hardy like this. He looked as though he was keeping going on his nerve alone. There was no blood in the man. I'd last seen him as a stocky, ruddy blonde, who looked like nothing so much as a wrestler, with his huge biceps, his ugly, good-natured face, and his bristling crop of yellow hair. Now he looked like a skeleton, with skin hanging loosely on the big frame. His face was a network of sagging wrinkles. Pouches bagged beneath his eyes, and those eyes were dull and glazed. About his neck, a black silk scarf was knotted tightly. "'Good God, Jack!' I exclaimed. "'What have you done to yourself?' He looked away quickly. "'Nothing,' he said brusquely. "'I'm all right. I want you to meet the Chevalier Foutain. This is Mark Prescott.' "'Pierre,' a voice said. "'Hollywood is no place for titles. Mark Prescott. The pleasure is mine.' I faced the Chevalier Pierre Foutain. We shook hands. My first impression was of icy cold and a slick kind of dryness, and I let go of his hand too quickly to be polite. He smiled at me. A charming man, the Chevalier, or so he seemed. Slender, below medium height, his bland, round face seemed incongruously youthful. Blonde hair was plastered close to his scalp. I saw that his cheeks were rouged, very deftly, but I know something about makeup. And under the rouge, I read a curious deathly pallor that would have made him a marked man had he not disguised it. Some disease, perhaps, had blanched his skin, but his lips were not artificially reddened, and they were as crimson as blood. He was clean-shaven, wore impeccable evening clothes, and his eyes were black pools of ink. "'Glad to know you,' I said. "'You're the vampire, eh?' He smiled. "'So they tell me. But we all serve the dark god of publicity, eh, Mr. Prescott?' Or is it Mark? It's Mark, I said, still staring at him. I saw his eyes go past me, and an extraordinary expression appeared on his face. An expression of amazement, disbelief. Swiftly it was gone. I turned. Jean was approaching, was at my side as I moved. She said, Is this the Chevalier? Pierre Foutain was staring at her, his lips parted a little. Almost inaudibly he murmured, Sonia. And then, on a note of interrogation, Sonia? I introduced the two. Jean said, You see, my name isn't Sonia. The Chevalier shook his head, an odd look in his black eyes. I once knew a girl like you, he said softly, very much like you. It's strange. Will you excuse me? I broke in. Jack Hardy was leaving the bar. Quickly, I followed him. I touched his shoulder as he went out the French windows. He jerked out a snarled oath, turned a white death mask of a face to me. Damn you, Mark, he snarled. Keep your hands to yourself. I put my hands on his shoulders and swung him around. What the devil has happened to you? I asked. Listen, Jack, you can't bluff me or lie to me. You know that. I've straightened you out enough times in the past, and I can do it again. Let me in on it. His ruined face softened. He reached up and took away my hands. His own were ice cold, like the hands of the Chevalier Foutain. No, he said. No use, Mark. 
There's nothing you can do. I'm all right, really. Just overstrain. I had too good a time in Paris. I was up against a blank wall. Suddenly, without volition, a thought popped into my mind and out of my mouth before I knew it. What's the matter with your neck? I asked abruptly. He didn't answer. He just frowned and shook his head. I have a throat infection, he told me. I caught it on the steamer. His hand went up and touched the black scarf. There was a croaking, harsh sound from behind us, a sound that didn't seem quite human. I turned. It was Hess Deming. He was swaying in the portal, his eyes glaring and bloodshot, a little trickle of saliva running down his chin. He said in a dead, expressionless voice that was somehow dreadful, Sandra died of a throat infection, Hardy. Jack didn't answer. He stumbled back a step. Hess went on dully. She got all white and died and the doctor didn't know what it was, although the death certificate said anemia. Did you bring back some filthy disease with you, Hardy? Because if you did, I'm going to kill you. Wait a minute, I said. A throat infection? I didn't know. There was a wound on her throat, two little marks close together. That wouldn't have killed her, unless some loathsome disease. You're crazy, Hess, I said. You know you're drunk. Listen to me. Jack couldn't have had anything to do with that. Hess didn't look at me. He watched Jack Hardy out of his bloodshot eyes. He went on in that low, deadly monotone. Will you swear Mark's right, Hardy? Will you? Jack's lips were twisted by some inner agony. I said, go on, Jack. Tell him he's wrong. Hardy burst out, I haven't been near your wife. I haven't seen her since I got back. There's... That's not the answer I want, Hess whispered. And he sprang for the other or reeled forward, rather. Hess was too drunk, and Jack too weak, for them to do each other any harm, but there was a nasty scuffle for a moment before I separated them. As I pulled them apart, Hess's hand clutched the scarf about Jack's neck and ripped it away. And I saw the marks on Jack Hardy's throat. Two red, angry little pits, white-rimmed, just over the jugular. It was the next day that Jean telephoned me. Mark, she said, we're going to run over a scene for Red Thirst tonight at the studio, stage six. You've been assigned as assistant director for the pick, so you should be there. And I had an idea Jack might not tell you. He's been so odd lately. Thanks, honey, I said. I'll be there, but I didn't know you were in the flicker. Neither did I, but there's been some wire pulling. Somebody wanted me in it, the Chevalier, I think, and the big boss phoned me this morning and let me in on the secret. I don't feel up to it, though. I had a bad night. Sorry, I sympathized. You were okay when I left you. I had a nightmare, she said slowly. It was rather frightful, Mark. It's funny, though. I can't remember what it was about. Well, you'll be there tonight? I said I would, but as it happened, I was unable to keep my promise. Hess Deming telephoned me, asking if I'd come out to his Malibu place and drive him into town. He was too shaky to handle a car himself, he said, and Saunders' cremation was to take place that afternoon. I got out my roadster and sent it spinning west on sunset. In twenty minutes, I was at Deming's beach house. The houseboy let me in, shaking his head gravely as he recognized me. Mr. Deming's pretty bad, he told me, all morning drinking gin straight. From upstairs, Hess shouted, That you, Mark? Okay, I'll be down right away. Come up here, Jim. The servant, with a meaningful glance at me, pattered upstairs. I wandered over to a table, examining the magazines upon it. A little breeze of wind came through the half-open window, fluttering a scrap of paper. A word on it caught my eye, and I picked up the note. For that's what it was. It was addressed to Hess, and after one glance I had no compunction about scanning it. Hess, dear, the message read, I feel I'm going to die very soon and I want you to do something for me. I've been out of my head, I know, saying things I didn't mean. Don't cremate me, Hess. Even though I'll be dead, I'd feel the fire. I know it. Bury me in a vault in Forest Lawn, and don't embalm me. I shall be dead when you find this, but I know you'll do as I wish, dear, and alive or dead, I'll always love you. The note was signed by Sandra Coulter, Hess's wife. I wondered whether Hess had seen it yet. There was a little hiss of indrawn breath from behind me. It was Jim, the houseboy. He said, Mr. Prescott, I found that note last night. Mr. Hess hasn't seen it. 
It's Miss Coulter's writing. He hesitated, and I read fear in his eyes. Sheer, unashamed fear. He put his forefinger on the note. See that, Mr. Prescott? He was pointing to a smudge of ink that half obscured the signature. I said, well? I did that, Mr. Prescott, when I picked up the note. The ink, it wasn't dry. I stared at him. He turned hastily at the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Hess Deming was coming down rather shakily. I think it was then that I first realized the horrible truth. I didn't believe it, though. Not then. It was too fantastic, too incredible. Yet something of the truth must have crept into my mind, for there was no other explanation for what I did then. Hess said, What have you got there, Mark? Nothing, I said quietly. I crumpled the note and thrust it into my pocket. Nothing important, anyway. Ready to go? He nodded, and we went to the door. I caught a glimpse of Jim staring after us, an expression of, was it relief? On his dark, wizened face. The crematory was in Pasadena, and I left Hess there. I would have stayed with him, but he wouldn't have it. I knew he didn't want anyone to be watching him when Sandra's body was being incinerated, and I knew it would be easier for him that way. I took a shortcut through the Hollywood Hills, and that's where the trouble started. I broke an axle. Recent rains had gullied the road, and I barely saved the car from turning over. After that, I had to hike miles to the nearest telephone, and then I wasted more time waiting for a taxi to pick me up. It was nearly 8 o'clock when I arrived at the studio. The gateman let me in, and I hurried to stage 6. It was dark. Cursing out of my breath, I turned away, and almost collided with a small figure. It was Forrest, one of the cameramen. He let out a curious squeal and clutched my arm. That you, Mark? Listen, will you do me a favor? I want you to watch some footage. I haven't time, I said. Have you seen Jean around here? I was supposed to... It's about that, Forrest said. He was a shriveled, monkey-faced little chap, but a mighty good cameraman. They've gone, Jean and Hardy and the Chevalier. There's something funny about that guy. Think so? Well, I'll phone Jean. I'll look at your rushes tomorrow. She won't be home, he told me. The Chevalier took her over to the Grove. Listen, Mark, you've got to watch this. Either I don't know how to handle a camera anymore, or that Frenchman is the damnedest thing I've ever shot. Come over to the theater. I've got the reel ready to run. Just develop the rough print myself. Oh, all right, I assented, and followed Forrest to the theater. I found a seat in the dark little auditorium, and listened to Forrest moving about in the projection booth. He clicked on the amplifier and said, Hardy didn't want any pictures taken, insisted on it, you know. But the boss told me to leave one of the automatic cameras going, not to bother with the sound, just to get an idea how the French guy would screen. Lucky it wasn't one of the old Rattler cameras, or Hardy would have caught on. Here it comes, Mark. I heard a click as the amplifier was switched off. White light flared on the screen. It faded, gave place to a picture, the interior of stage six. The set was incongruous, a mid-Victorian parlor, with overstuffed plush chairs, gilt-edged paintings, even a particularly hideous whatnot. Jack Hardy moved into the range of the camera. On the screen, his face seemed to leap out at me like a death's head, covered with sagging, wrinkled skin. Following him came Jean, wearing a tailored suit. No one dresses for rehearsals. And behind her... I blinked, thinking that my eyes were tricking me. Something like a glowing fog, oval, tall as a man, was moving across the screen. You've seen the nimbus of light on the screen when a flashlight is turned directly on the camera. Well, it was like that, except that its source was not traceable. And horribly, it moved forward at about the pace a man would walk. The amplifier clicked again. Forrest said, When I saw it on the negative, I thought I was screwy, Mark. I saw the take. There wasn't any funny light there. The oval glowing haze was motionless beside Jean, and she was looking directly at it, a smile on her lips. Mark, when that was taken, Jean was looking right at the French guy. I said, somewhat hoarsely, hold it, Forrest, right there. The images slowed down, became motionless. Jean's profile was toward the camera. I leaned forward, staring at something I had glimpsed on the girl's neck. It was scarcely visible save as a tiny discolored mark on Jean's throat, above the jugular, but unmistakably the same wound I had seen on the throat of Jack Hardy the night before. 
I heard the amplifier click off. Suddenly the screen showed blindingly white and then went black. I waited a moment, but there was no sound from the booth. Forrest, I called. You okay? There was no sound. The faint whirring of the projector had died. I got up quickly and went to the back of the theater. There were two entrances to the booth, a door which opened on stairs leading down to the alley outside, and a hole in the floor reached by means of a metal ladder. I went up this swiftly, an ominous apprehension mounting within me. Forrest was still there, but he was no longer alive. He lay sprawled on his back, his wizened face staring up blindly, his head twisted at an impossible angle. It was quite apparent that his neck had been broken almost instantly. I sent a hasty glance at the projector. The can of film was gone, and the door opening on the stairway was ajar a few inches. I stepped out on the stairs, although I knew I would see no one. The white-lit broad alley between stages six and four was silent and empty. The sound of running feet came to me, steadily growing louder. A man came racing into view. I recognized him as one of the publicity gang. I hailed him. Can't wait, he gasped, but slowed down nevertheless. I said, have you seen anyone around here just now? The Chevalier Foutain? He shook his head. No, but... His face was white as he looked up at me. Hess Deming's gone crazy. I've got to contact the papers. Ice gripped me. I raced down the stairs, clutched his arm. What do you mean? I snapped. Hess was all right when I left him. A bit tight, that's all. His face was glistening with sweat. It's awful. I'm not sure yet what happened. His wife, Sandra Coulter, came to life while they were cremating her. They saw her through the window, you know, screaming and pounding at the glass while she was being burned alive. Hess got her out too late. He went stark raving mad. Suspended animation, they say. I've got to get to a phone, Mr. Prescott. He tore himself away, sprinted in the direction of the administration buildings. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out a scrap of paper. It was the note I had found at Hess Deming's house. The words danced and wavered before my eyes. Over and over I was telling myself, it can't be true, such things can't happen. I didn't mean Sandra Coulter's terrible resurrection during the cremation. That alone might be plausibly explained catalepsy, perhaps. But taken in conjunction with certain other occurrences, it led to one definite conclusion, and it was a conclusion I dared not face. What had poor Forrest said? That the Chevalier was taking Jean to Coconut Grove? Well, the taxi was still waiting. I got in. The ambassador, I told the driver grimly, 20 bucks if you hit the green lights all the way. All night I had been combing Hollywood, without success. Neither the Chevalier Foutain nor Jean had been to the Grove, I discovered, and no one knew the Chevalier's address. A telephone call to the studio, now ablaze with the excitement over the Hess Deming disaster and the forest killing, netted me exactly nothing. I went the rounds of Hollywood nightlife vainly, the Trocadero, Sardis, all three of the Brown Derbies, the smart notorious clubs of the Sunset 80s. Nowhere could I find my quarry. I telephoned Jack Hardy a dozen times, but got no answer. Finally, in a private club in Culver City, I met with my first stroke of good luck. Mr. Hardy's upstairs, the proprietor told me, looking anxious. Nothing wrong, I hope, Mr. Prescott. I heard about Deming. Nothing, I said. Take me up to him. He's sleeping it off, the man admitted. Tried to drink the place dry, and I put him upstairs where he'd be safe. Not the first time, eh? I said, with an assumption of lightness. Well, bring up some coffee, will you? Black. I've got to talk to him. But it was half an hour before Hardy was in any shape to understand what I was saying. At last, he sat up on the couch, blinking, and a gleam of realization came into his sunken eyes. Prescott, he said, can't you leave me alone? I leaned close to him, articulating carefully so that he would be sure to understand me. I know what the Chevalier Foutain is, I said, and I waited for the dreadful, impossible confirmation or for the words which would convince me that I was an insane fool. Hardy looked at me dully. How did you find out? He whispered. An icy shock went through me. Up to that moment, I had not really believed, in spite of all the evidence. But now Hardy was confirming the suspicions which I had not let myself believe. I didn't answer his question. Instead, I said, 
do you know about Hess? He nodded, and at the sight of the agony in his face, I almost pitied him. Then the thought of Jean steadied me. Do you know where he is now? I asked. No, what are you talking about? He flared suddenly. Are you mad, Mark? Do you... I'm not mad, but Hess Deming is. He looked at me like a cowering, whipped dog. I went on grimly. Are you going to tell me the truth? How you got those marks on your throat? How you met this creature? And where he's taken Jean? Jean? He looked genuinely startled. Has he got... I didn't know that, Mark. I swear I didn't. You've been a good friend to me, and... And I'll tell you the truth, for your sake and Jean's. Although now it may be too late. My involuntary movement made him glance at me quickly. Then he went on. I met him in Paris. I was out after new sensations, but I didn't expect anything like that. A Satanist club. Devil worshippers, they were. The ordinary stuff. Cheap, furtive blasphemy. But it was there that I met... him. He can be a fascinating chap when he tries. He drew me out, made me tell him about Hollywood, about the women we have here. I bragged a little. He asked me about the stars, whether they were really as beautiful as they seemed. His eyes were hungry as he listened to me, Mark. Then one night I had a fearful nightmare. A monstrous black horror crept in through the window and attacked me. Bit me in the throat I dreamed, or thought I did. After that, I was in his power. He told me the truth. He made me his slave, and I could do nothing. His powers, they're not human. I licked dry lips. Hardy continued. He made me bring him here, introducing him as a new discovery to be starring in Red Thirst. I'd mentioned the picture to him before I knew. How he must have laughed at me. He made me serve him, keeping away photographers, making sure that there were no cameras, no mirrors near him. And for a reward, he let me live. I knew I should feel contempt for Hardy, panderer to such a loathsome evil, but somehow I couldn't. I said quietly, what about Jean? Where does the Chevalier live? He told me. But you can't do anything, Mark. There's a vault under the house where he stays during the day. It can't be opened, except with a key that he always keeps with him. A silver key. He had a door specially made, and then did something to it so that nothing can open it but that key. Even dynamite wouldn't do it, he told me. I said, such things can be killed. Not easily, Sandra Coulter was a victim of his. After death, she too became a vampire, sleeping by day and living only at night. The fire destroyed her, but there's no way to get into the vault under Futain's house. I wasn't thinking of fire, I said. A knife. Through the heart, Hardy interrupted almost eagerly. Yes, and decapitation. I've thought of it myself, but I can do nothing. I'm his slave, Mark. I said nothing but pressed the bell. Presently, the proprietor appeared. Can you get me a butcher knife? I measured with my hands. About so long? A sharp one? Accustomed to strange requests, he nodded. Right away, Mr. Prescott. As I followed him out, Hardy said weakly, Mark. I turned. Good luck, he said. The look on his wrecked face robbed the words of their pathos. Thanks, I forced myself to say. I don't blame you, Jack, for what's happened. I'd have done the same. I left him there, slumped on the couch, staring after me with eyes that had looked into hell. It was past daylight when I drove out of Culver City, a long, razor-edged knife hidden securely inside my coat. And the day went past all too quickly. A telephone call told me that Jean had not yet returned home. It took me more than an hour to locate a certain man I wanted, a man who had worked for the studio before on certain delicate jobs. There was little about locks he did not know, as the police had sometimes ruefully admitted. His name was Axel Ferguson, a bulky, good-natured Swede, whose thick fingers seemed more adapted to handling a shovel than the mechanisms of locks. Yet he was as expert as Houdini. Indeed, he had at one time been a professional magician. The front door of Futain's isolated canyon home proved no bar to Ferguson's fingers and the tiny sliver of steel he used. The house, a modern two-story place, seemed deserted, but Hardy had said, below the house. We went down the cellar stairs and found ourselves in a concrete-lined passage that ran down at a slight angle for perhaps thirty feet. There, the corridor ended in what seemed to be a blank wall of bluish steel. 
The glossy surface of the door was unbroken, save for a single keyhole. Ferguson set to work. At first, he hummed under his breath, but after a time, he worked in silence. Sweat began to glisten on his face. Trepidation assailed me as I watched. The flashlight he had placed beside him grew dim. He inserted another battery, got out unfamiliar-looking apparatus. He buckled on dark goggles and handed me a pair. A blue, intensely brilliant flame began to play on the door. It was useless. The torch was discarded after a time, and Ferguson returned to his tools. He was using a stethoscope, taking infinite pains in the delicate movements of his hands. It was fascinating to watch him, but all the time I realized that the night was coming, that presently the sun would go down, and that the life of the vampire lasts from sunset to sunrise. At last, Ferguson gave up. I can't do it, he told me, panting as though from a hard race. And if I can't, nobody can. Even Houdini couldn't have broken this lock. The only thing that'll open it is that key. All right, Axel, I said dully. Here's your money. He hesitated, watching me. You going to stay here, Mr. Prescott? Yeah, I said. You can find your way out. I'll wait a while. Well, I'll leave the light with you, he said. You can let me have it sometime, eh? He waited, and as I made no answer, he departed, shaking his head. Then utter silence closed around me. I took the knife out of my coat, tested its edge against my thumb, and settled back to wait. Less than half an hour later, the steel door began to swing open. I stood up. Through the widening crack, I saw a bare, steel-lined chamber, empty save for a long black object that rested on the floor. It was a coffin. The door was wide. Into view moved a white, slender figure, Jean, clad in a diaphanous silken robe. Her eyes were wide, fixed, and staring. She looked like a sleepwalker. A man followed her, a man wearing impeccable evening clothes. Not a hair was out of place on his sleek blonde head, and he was touching his lips delicately with a handkerchief as he came out of the vault. There was a little crimson stain on the white linen where his lips had brushed. Jean walked past me as though I didn't exist, but the Chevalier Foutain paused, his eyebrows lifted, his black eyes pierced through me. The handle of the knife was hot in my hand. I moved aside to block Foutain's way. Behind me came a rustle of silk, and from the corner of my eye I saw Jean pause hesitatingly. The Chevalier eyed me, toying negligently with his handkerchief. Mark, he said slowly, Mark Prescott. His eyes flickered toward the knife, and a little smile touched his lips. I said, you know why I'm here, don't you? Yes, he said, I heard you. I was not disturbed. Only one thing can open this door. From his pocket, he drew a key, shining with a dull silver sheen. Only this, he finished, replacing it. Your knife is useless, Mark Prescott. Maybe, I said, edging forward very slightly. What have you done to Jean? A curious expression, almost of pain, flashed into his eyes. She is mine, he shot out half angrily. You can do nothing. I sprang then, or at least I tried to. The blade of the knife sheared down straight for Futain's white shirt front. It was arrested in midair, yet he had not moved. His eyes had bored into mine, suddenly, terribly, and it seemed as though a wave of fearful energy had blasted out at me, paralyzing me, rendering me helpless. I stood rigid. Veins throbbed in my temples as I tried to move, to bring down the knife. It was useless. I stood as immovable as a statue. The Chevalier brushed past me. Follow, he said almost casually, and like an automaton I swung about, began to move along the passage. What hellish hypnotic power was this that held me helpless? Futain led the way upstairs. It was not yet dark, although the sun had gone down. I followed him into a room, and at his gesture dropped into a chair. At my side was a small table. The Chevalier touched my arm gently, and something like a mild electric shock went through me. The knife dropped from my fingers, clattering to the table. Jean was standing rigidly nearby, her eyes dull and expressionless. Futain moved to her side, put an arm around her waist. My mouth felt as though it were filled with mud, but somehow I managed to croak out articulate words. 
damn you, Futane. Leave her alone. He released her and came toward me, his face dark with anger. You fool. I could kill you now, very easily. I could make you go down to the busiest corner of Hollywood and slit your throat with that knife. I have that power. The face of a beast looking into mine. He snarled. She is not yours, nor is she Jean. She is Sonia. I remembered what Futane had murmured when he had first seen Jean. He read the question in my eyes. I knew a girl like that once, very long ago. That was Sonia. They killed her, put a stake through her heart, long ago in Thurn. Now that I've found this girl, who might be a reincarnation of Sonia, they are so alike, I shall not give her up, nor can anyone force me. You've made her a devil like yourself, I said through half-paralyzed lips. I'd rather kill her. Futane turned to watch Jean. Not yet, he said softly. She is mine, yes. She bears the stigmata, but she is still alive. She will not become a vampire until she has died, or until she has tasted the red milk. She shall do that tonight. I cursed him bitterly, foully. He touched my lips, and I could utter no sound. Then they left me, Jean and her master. I heard a door close quietly. The night dragged on. Futile struggles had convinced me that it was useless to attempt escape. I could not even force a whisper through my lips. More than once I felt myself on the verge of madness, thinking of Jean and remembering Futane's ominous words. Eventually agony brought its own surcease, and I fell into a kind of coma, lasting for how long I could not guess. Many hours had passed, I knew, before I heard footsteps coming toward my prison. Jean moved into my range of vision. I searched her face with my eyes, seeking for some mark of a dreadful metamorphosis. I could find none. Her beauty was unmarred, save for the terrible little wounds on her throat. She went to a couch and quietly lay down, her eyes closed. The Chevalier came past me and went to Jean's side. He stood looking down at her. I have mentioned before the incongruous youthfulness of his face. That was gone now. He looked old. Old beyond imagination. At last he shrugged and turned to me. His fingers brushed my lips again, and I found that I could speak. Life flooded back into my veins, benign lancing twinges of pain. I moved an arm experimentally. The paralysis was leaving me. The Chevalier said, She is still... clean. I could not do it. Amazement flooded me. My eyes widened in disbelief. Futane smiled wryly. It is quite true. I could have made her as myself, undead. But at the last moment I forbade her. He looked toward the windows. It will be dawn soon. I glanced at the knife on the table beside me. The Chevalier put out a hand and drew it away. Wait, he said. There is something I must tell you, Mark Prescott. You say that you know who and what I am. I nodded. Through the ages I have come, since first I fell victim to another vampire, for thus is the evil spread. Deathless and not alive, bringing fear and sorrow always, knowing the bitter agony of Tantalus, I have gone down through the weary centuries. I have known Richard and Henry and Elizabeth of England, and ever have I brought terror and destruction in the night, for I am an alien thing, I am the undead. The quiet voice went on, holding me motionless in its weird spell. I, the vampire, I, the accursed, the shining evil, negotium perambulans and tenebris, but I was not always thus. Long ago in Thurn, before the shadow leapt upon me, I loved a girl, Sonia, but the vampire visited me, and I sickened and died, and awoke. Then I arose. It is the curse of the undead to prey upon those they love. I visited Sonia. I made her my own. She too died, and for a brief while we walked the earth together, neither alive nor dead. But that was not Sonia. It was her body, yes, but I had not loved her body alone. I realized too late that I had destroyed her utterly. One day they opened her grave, and the priest drove a stake through her heart and gave her rest. Me they could not find, for my coffin was hidden too well. I put love behind me then, knowing that there was none for such as I. 
Hope came to me when I found Jean. Hundreds of years have passed since Sonia crumbled to dust, but I thought I had found her again, and I took her. Nothing human could prevent me. The Chevalier's eyelids sagged. He looked infinitely old. Nothing human. Yet in the end I found that I could not condemn her to the hell that is mine. I thought I had forgotten love. But long and long ago, I loved Sonia. And because of her, and because I know that I would only destroy, as I once did before, I shall not work my will on this girl. I turned to watch the still figure on the couch. The Chevalier followed my gaze and nodded slowly. Yes, she bears the stigmata. She will die, unless... He met my gaze unblinkingly. Unless I die. If you had broken into the vault yesterday, if you had sunk that knife into my heart, she would be free now. He glanced at the windows again. The sun will rise soon. Then he went quickly to Jean's side. He looked down at her for a moment. She is very beautiful, he murmured. Too beautiful for hell. The Chevalier swung about, went toward the door. As he passed me, he threw something carelessly on the table, something that tinkled as it fell. In the portal he paused, and a little smile twisted the scarlet lips. I remembered him thus, framed against the black background of the doorway, his sleek blonde head erect and unafraid. He lifted his arm in a gesture that should have been theatrical, but somehow wasn't. And so, farewell, I who am about to die. He did not finish. In the faint grayness of dawn I saw him striding away, heard his footsteps on the stairs, receding and faint, heard a muffled clang as of a great door closing. The paralysis had left me. I was trembling a little, for I realized what I must do soon, but I knew I would not fail. I glanced down at the table. Even before I saw what lay beside the knife, I knew what would be there. A silver key. The village of Maxley, where, last summer and autumn, these strange events took place, lies on a heathery and pine-clad upland of Sussex. In all England, you could not find a sweeter and saner situation. Should the wind blow from the south, it comes laden with the spices of the sea. To the east, high downs protect it from the inclemencies of March. And from the west and north, the breezes which reach it travel over miles of aromatic forest and heather. The village itself is insignificant enough in point of population, but rich in amenities and beauty. Halfway down the single street, with its broad road and spacious areas of grass on each side, stands the little Norman church and the antique graveyard, long disused. For the rest, there are a dozen small, sedate Georgian houses, red-bricked and long-windowed, each with a square of flower garden in front and an ampler strip behind. A score of shops and a couple of score of thatched cottages belonging to laborers on neighboring estates complete the entire cluster of its peaceful habitations. The general peace, however, is sadly broken on Saturdays and Sundays, for we lie on one of the main roads between London and Brighton, and our quiet street becomes a race course for flying motor cars and bicycles. A notice just outside the village begging them to go slowly only seems to encourage them to accelerate their speed, for the road lies open and straight, and there is really no reason why they should do otherwise. By way of protest, therefore, the ladies of Maxley cover their noses and mouths with their handkerchiefs as they see a motor car approaching, though, as the street is asphalted, they need not really take these precautions against dust. But late on Sunday night, the horde of scorchers has passed, and we settle down again to five days of cheerful and leisurely seclusion. Railway strikes, which agitate the country so much, leave us undisturbed, because most of the inhabitants of Maxley never leave it at all. I am the fortunate possessor of one of these small Georgian houses, and consider myself no less fortunate in having so interesting and stimulating a neighbor as Francis Urcomb, who, the most confirmed of Maxleyites, has not slept away from his house, which stands just opposite to mine in the village street, for nearly two years, at which date, though still in middle life, he resigned his physiological professorship at Cambridge University, 
and devoted himself to the study of those occult and curious phenomena which seem equally to concern the physical and the psychical sides of human nature. Indeed, his retirement was not unconnected with his passion for the strange, uncharted places that lie on the confines and borders of science, the existence of which is so stoutly denied by the more materialistic minds, for he advocated that all medical students should be obliged to pass some sort of examination in mesmerism, and that one of the Tripos papers should be designed to test their knowledge in such subjects as appearances at time of death, haunted houses, vampirism, automatic writing, and possession. Of course they wouldn't listen to me, ran his account of the matter, for there is nothing that these seats of learning are so frightened of as knowledge, and the road to knowledge lies in the study of things like these. The functions of the human frame are, broadly speaking, known. They are a country, anyhow, that has been charted and mapped out. But outside that lie huge tracts of undiscovered country, which certainly exist, and the real pioneers of knowledge are those who, at the cost of being derided as credulous and superstitious, want to push on into those misty and probably perilous places. I felt that I could be of more use by setting out without compass or knapsack into the mists than by sitting in a cage like a canary and chirping about what was known. Besides, teaching is very bad for a man who knows himself only to be a learner. You only need to be a self-conceited ass to teach. Here, then, in Francis Urcom, was a delightful neighbor to one who, like myself, has an uneasy and burning curiosity about what he called the misty and perilous places. And this last spring, we had a further and most welcome addition to our pleasant little community, in the person of Mrs. Amworth, widow of an Indian civil servant. Her husband had been a judge in the northwest provinces, and after his death at Peshawar, she came back to England, and after a year in London, found herself starving for the ampler air and sunshine of the country, to take the place of the fogs and griminess of town. She had, too, a special reason for settling in Maxley, since her ancestors, up till a hundred years ago, had long been native to the place, and in the old churchyard, now disused, are many gravestones bearing her maiden name of Chaston. Big and energetic, her vigorous and genial personality speedily woke Maxley up to a higher degree of sociality than it had ever known. Most of us were bachelors or spinsters, or elderly folk not much inclined to exert ourselves in the expense and effort of hospitality, and hitherto the gaiety of a small tea party, with bridge afterwards and galoshes when it was wet, to trip home in again for a solitary dinner, was about the climax of our festivities. But Mrs. Amworth showed us a more gregarious way, and set an example of luncheon parties and little dinners, which we began to follow. On other nights, when no such hospitality was on foot, a lone man like myself found it pleasant to know that a call on the telephone to Mrs. Amworth's house not a hundred yards off, and an inquiry as to whether I might come over after dinner for a game of piquet before bedtime would probably evoke a response of welcome. There she would be, with a comrade-like eagerness for companionship, and there was a glass of port and a cup of coffee and a cigarette and a game of piquet. She played the piano, too, in a free and exuberant manner, and had a charming voice and sang to her own accompaniment. And as the days grew long and the light lingered late, we played our game in her garden, which in the course of a few months she had turned from being a nursery for slugs and snails into a glowing patch of luxuriant blossoming. She was always cheery and jolly, she was interested in everything, and in music, in gardening, in games of all sorts, was a competent performer. Everybody, with one exception, liked her. Everybody felt her to bring with her the tonic of a sunny day. That one exception was Francis Urcombe. He, though he confessed he did not like her, acknowledged that he was vastly interested in her. This always seemed strange to me, for pleasant and jovial as she was, I could see nothing in her that could call forth conjecture or intrigued surmise, so healthy and unmysterious a figure did she present. But of the genuineness of Urcombe's interest there could be no doubt. One could see him watching and scrutinizing her. In matter of age, she frankly volunteered the information that she was forty-five, but her briskness, her activity, her unravaged skin, her coal-black hair, made it difficult to believe that she was not adopting an unusual device and adding ten years onto her age instead of subtracting them. Often, also, as our quite unsentimental friendship ripened, Mrs. Amworth would ring me up and propose her advent. 
If I was busy writing, I was to give her, so we definitely bargained, a frank negative, and in answer I could hear her jolly laugh and her wishes for a successful evening of work. Sometimes, before her proposal arrived, Urcombe would already have stepped across from his house opposite for a smoke and a chat, and he, hearing who my intended visitor was, always urged me to beg her to come. She and I should play our piquet, said he, and he would look on, if we did not object, and learn something of the game. But I doubt whether he paid much attention to it, for nothing could be clearer than that, under that penthouse of forehead and thick eyebrows, his attention was fixed not on the cards, but on one of the players. But he seemed to enjoy an hour spent thus, and often, until one particular evening in July, he would watch her with the air of a man who has some deep problem in front of him. She, enthusiastically keen about our game, seemed not to notice his scrutiny. Then came that evening when, as I see in the light of subsequent events, began the first twitching of the veil that hid the secret horror from my eyes. I did not know it then, though I noticed that thereafter, if she rang up to propose coming round, she always asked not only if I was at leisure, but whether Mr. Urcombe was with me. If so, she said, she would not spoil the chat of two old bachelors, and laughingly wish me good night. Urcombe, on this occasion, had been with me for some half an hour before Mrs. Amworth's appearance, and had been talking to me about the medieval beliefs concerning vampirism, one of those borderland subjects which he declared had not been sufficiently studied before it had been consigned by the medical profession to the dust heap of exploded superstitions. There he sat, grim and eager, tracing with that pellucid clearness which had made him in his Cambridge days so admirable a lecturer, the history of those mysterious visitations. In them all, there were the same general features. One of those ghoulish spirits took up its abode in a living man or woman, conferring supernatural powers of bat-like flight and glutting itself with nocturnal blood feasts. When its host died, it continued to dwell in the corpse, which remained undecayed. By day it rested, by night it left the grave and went on its awful errands. No European country in the Middle Ages seemed to have escaped them. Earlier yet, parallels were to be found in Roman and Greek and in Jewish history. It's a large order to set all that evidence aside as being moonshine, he said. Hundreds of totally independent witnesses in many ages have testified to the occurrence of these phenomena, and there's no explanation known to me which covers all the facts. And if you feel inclined to say, why then, if these are facts, do we not come across them now? There are two answers I can make you. One is that there were diseases known in the Middle Ages, such as the Black Death, which were certainly existent then and which have become extinct since, but for that reason we do not assert that such diseases ever existed. Just as the Black Death visited England and decimated the population of Norfolk, so here in this very district about 300 years ago, there was certainly an outbreak of vampirism, and Maxley was the center of it. My second answer is even more convincing, for I tell you that vampirism is by no means extinct now. An outbreak of it certainly occurred in India a year or two ago. At that moment I heard my knocker plied in the cheerful and peremptory manner in which Mrs. Amworth is accustomed to announce her arrival, and I went to the door to open it. "'Come in at once,' I said, "'and save me from having my blood curdled. Mr. Urcombe has been trying to alarm me.' Instantly her vital, voluminous presence seemed to fill the room. "'Ah, but how lovely,' she said. "'I delight in having my blood curdled.' Go on with your ghost story, Mr. Urcombe. I adore ghost stories. I saw that, as his habit was, he was intently observing her. It wasn't a ghost story exactly, said he. I was only telling our host how vampirism was not extinct yet. I was saying that there was an outbreak of it in India only a few years ago. There was a more than perceptible pause, and I saw that, if Urcombe was observing her, she on her side was observing him, with fixed eye and parted mouth. Then her jolly laugh invaded that rather tense silence. "'Oh, what a shame,' she said. "'You're not going to curdle my blood at all. "'Where did you pick up such a tale, Mr. Urcombe? "'I have lived for years in India "'and never heard a rumor of such a thing. "'Some storyteller in the bazaars must have invented it. "'They are famous at that.' "'I could see that Urcombe was on the point "'of saying something further, but checked himself. "'Ah, very likely that was it,' he said." But something had disturbed our usual peaceful sociability that night, and something had damped Mrs. Amworth's usual high spirits. 
She had no gusto for PK and left after a couple of games. Ercombe had been silent too. Indeed, he hardly spoke again till she departed. That was unfortunate, he said, for the outbreak of... of a very mysterious disease, let us call it, took place at Peshawar, where she and her husband were. And... Well, I asked. He was one of the victims of it, said he. Naturally, I had quite forgotten that when I spoke. The summer was unreasonably hot and rainless, and Maxley suffered much from drought, and also from a plague of big black night-flying gnats, the bite of which was very irritating and virulent. They came sailing in of an evening, settling on one's skin so quietly that one perceived nothing till the sharp stab announced that one had been bitten. They did not bite the hands or face, but chose always the neck and throat for their feeding ground, and most of us, as the poison spread, assumed a temporary goiter. Then, about the middle of August, appeared the first of those mysterious cases of illness, which our local doctor attributed to the long-continued heat, coupled with the bite of these venomous insects. The patient was a boy of 16 or 17, the son of Mrs. Amworth's gardener, and the symptoms were an anemic pallor and a languid prostration, accompanied by great drowsiness and an abnormal appetite. He had, too, on his throat two small punctures, where, so Dr. Ross conjectured, one of these great gnats had bitten him. But the odd thing was that there was no swelling or inflammation round the place where he had been bitten. The heat at this time had begun to abate, but the cooler weather failed to restore him, and the boy, in spite of the quantity of good food which he so ravenously swallowed, wasted away to a skin-clad skeleton. I met Dr. Ross in the street one afternoon about this time, and in answer to my inquiries about his patient, he said that he was afraid the boy was dying. The case, he confessed, completely puzzled him. Some obscure form of pernicious anemia was all he could suggest. But he wondered whether Mr. Ercombe would consent to see the boy, on the chance of his being able to throw some new light on the case. And since Ercombe was dining with me that night, I proposed to Dr. Ross to join us. He could not do this, but said he would look in later. When he came, Ercombe at once consented to put his skill at the other's disposal, and together they went off at once. Being thus shorn of my sociable evening, I telephoned to Mrs. Amworth to know if I might inflict myself on her for an hour. Her answer was a welcoming affirmative, and between piquet and music, the hour lengthened itself into two. She spoke of the boy who was lying so desperately and mysteriously ill, and told me that she had often been to see him, taking him nourishing and delicate food. But today, and her kind eyes moistened as she spoke, she was afraid she had paid her last visit. Knowing the antipathy between her and Ercombe, I did not tell her that he had been called into consultation, and when I returned home she accompanied me to my door, for the sake of a breath of night air, and in order to borrow a magazine which contained an article on gardening which she wanted to read. Ah, this delicious night air, she said, luxuriously sniffing in the coolness. Night air and gardening are the great tonics. There is nothing so stimulating as bare contact with rich Mother Earth. You are never so fresh as when you've been grubbing in the soil. Black hands, black nails, and boots covered with mud. She gave her great jovial laugh. I'm a glutton for air and earth, she said. Positively I look forward to death, for then I shall be buried and have the kind earth all around me. No leaden caskets for me. I've given explicit directions. But what shall I do about air? Well, I suppose one can't have everything. The magazine? A thousand thanks. I will faithfully return it. Good night. Garden and keep your windows open, and you won't have anemia. I always sleep with my windows open, said I. I went straight up to my bedroom, of which one of the windows looks out over the street, and as I undressed I thought I heard voices talking outside not far away. But I paid no particular attention, put out my lights, and falling asleep plunged into the depths of a most horrible dream, distortedly suggested, no doubt, by my last words with Mrs. Amworth. I dreamed that I woke, and found that both my bedroom windows were shut. Half suffocating, I dreamed that I sprang out of bed, and went across to open them. The blind over the first was drawn down, and pulling it up I saw, with the indescribable horror of incipient nightmare, Mrs. Amworth's face suspended close to the pane in the darkness outside, nodding and smiling at me. Pulling down the blind again to keep that terror out, I rushed to the second window on the other side of the room, 
and there again was Mrs. Amworth's face. Then the panic came upon me in full blast. Here was I suffocating in the airless room, and whichever window I opened, Mrs. Amworth's face would float in, like those noiseless black gnats that bit before one was aware. The nightmare rose to a screaming point, and with strangled yells I awoke to find my room cool and quiet, with both windows open and blinds up, and a half-moon high in its course, casting an oblong of tranquil light on the floor. But even when I was awake the horror persisted, and I lay tossing and turning. I must have slept long before the nightmare seized me, for now it was nearly day, and soon in the east the drowsy eyelids of morning began to lift. I was scarcely downstairs next morning, for after the dawn I slept late, when Urcombe rang up to know if he might see me immediately. He came in, grim and preoccupied, and I noticed that he was pulling on a pipe that was not even filled. "'I want your help,' he said, "'and so I must tell you first of all of what happened last night. I went round with the little doctor to see his patient, and found him just alive, but scarcely more.' I instantly diagnosed in my own mind what this anemia, unaccountable by any other explanation, meant. The boy is the prey of a vampire. He put his empty pipe on the breakfast table, by which I had just sat down, and folded his arms, looking at me steadily from under his overhanging brows. Now about last night, he said, I insisted that he should be moved from his father's cottage into my house. As we were carrying him on a stretcher, whom should we meet but Mrs. Amworth? She expressed shocked surprise that we were moving him. Now why do you think she did that? With a start of horror, as I remembered my dream that night before, I felt an idea come into my mind so preposterous and unthinkable that I instantly turned it out again. I haven't the smallest idea, I said. Then listen while I tell you about what happened later. I put out all light in the room where the boy lay and watched. One window was a little open, for I had forgotten to close it and about midnight I heard something outside, trying apparently to push it farther open. I guessed who it was. Yes, it was full twenty feet from the ground, and I peeped round the corner of the blind. Just outside was the face of Mrs. Amworth, and her hand was on the frame of the window. Very softly I crept close, and then banged the window down, and I think I just caught the tip of one of her fingers. But it's impossible, I cried. How could she be floating in the air like that? And what did she come for? Don't tell me such. Once more, with closer grip, the remembrance of my nightmare seized me. I am telling you what I saw, said he. And all night long, until it was nearly day, she was fluttering outside, like some terrible bat, trying to gain admittance. Now put together various things I have told you. He began checking them off on his fingers. Number one, he said, there was an outbreak of disease similar to that which this boy is suffering from at Peshawar, and her husband died of it. Number two, Mrs. Amworth protested against my moving the boy to my house. Number three, she, or the demon that inhabits her body, a creature powerful and deadly, tries to gain admittance. And add this, too. In medieval times, there was an epidemic of vampirism here at Maxley. The vampire, so the accounts run, was found to be Elizabeth Chaston, I see you remember Mrs. Amworth's maiden name. Finally, the boy is stronger this morning. He would certainly not have been alive if he had been visited again. And what do you make of it? There was a long silence, during which I found this incredible horror assuming the hues of reality. I have something to add, I said, which may or may not bear on it. You said that the, the specter went away shortly before dawn. Yes, I told him of my dream, and he smiled grimly. Yes, you did well to awake, he said. That warning came from your subconscious self, which never wholly slumbers, and cried out to you of deadly danger. For two reasons, then, you must help me. One, to save others. The second, to save yourself. What do you want me to do? I asked. I want you, first of all, to help me in watching this boy, and ensuring that she does not come near him. Eventually, I want you to help me in tracking the thing down, in exposing and destroying it. It is not human. It is an incarnate fiend. What steps we shall have to take, I don't yet know. It was now eleven of the forenoon, and presently I went across to his house for a twelve-hour vigil while he slept, to come on duty again that night, so that for the next twenty-four hours, either Urcombe or myself was always in the room where the boy, now getting stronger every hour, was lying. 
The day following was Saturday, and a morning of brilliant, pellucid weather. And already, when I went across to his house to resume my duty, the stream of motors down to Brighton had begun. Simultaneously, I saw Urcom with a cheerful face, which boded good news of his patient, coming out of his house, and Mrs. Amworth, with a gesture of salutation to me and a basket in her hand, walking up the broad strip of grass which bordered the road. There we all three met. I noticed, and saw that Urcom noticed it too, that one finger of her left hand was bandaged. "'Good morning to you both,' said she, "'and I hear your patient is doing well, Mr. Urcom. I've come to bring him a bowl of jelly and to sit with him for an hour. He and I are great friends. I'm overjoyed at his recovery. Urcom paused a moment, as if making up his mind, and then shot out a pointing finger at her. I forbid that, he said. You shall not sit with him or see him, and you know the reason as well as I do. I have never seen so horrible a change pass over a human face as that which now blanched hers to the color of a gray mist. She put up her hand as if to shield herself from that pointing finger, which drew the sign of the cross in the air, and shrank back cowering onto the road. There was a wild hoot from a horn, a grinding of brakes, a shout, too late, from a passing car, and one long scream suddenly cut short. Her body rebounded from the roadway after the first wheel had gone over it, and the second followed. It lay there, quivering and twitching, and was still. She was buried three days afterwards in the cemetery outside Maxley, in accordance with the wishes she had told me that she had devised about her interment, and the shock which her sudden and awful death had caused to the little community began by degrees to pass off. To two people only, Urcom and myself, the horror of it was mitigated from the first by the nature of the relief that her death brought, but naturally enough we kept our own counsel, and no hint of what greater horror had been thus averted was ever let slip. But oddly enough, so it seemed to me, he was still not satisfied about something in connection with her, and would give no answer to my questions on the subject. Then, as the days of a tranquil, mellow September and the October that followed, began to drop away like the leaves of the yellowing trees, his uneasiness relaxed. But before the entry of November, the seeming tranquility broke into a hurricane. I had been dining one night at the far end of the village, and about eleven o'clock was walking home again. The moon was of an unusual brilliance, rendering all that it shone on as distinct as in some etching. I had just come opposite the house which Mrs. Amworth had occupied, where there was a board up telling that it was to let, when I heard the click of her front gate, and next moment I saw, with a sudden chill and quaking of my very spirit, that she stood there. Her profile, vividly illuminated, was turned to me, and I could not be mistaken in my identification of her. She appeared not to see me. Indeed, the shadow of the yew hedge in front of her garden enveloped me in its blackness, and she went swiftly across the road and entered the gate of the house directly opposite. There I lost sight of her completely. My breath was coming in short pants as if I had been running, and now indeed I ran, with fearful backward glances, along the hundred yards that separated me from my house and Urcombe's. It was to his that my flying steps took me, and next minute I was within. "'What have you come to tell me?' he asked. "'Or shall I guess?' "'You can't guess,' said I. "'No, it's no guess. She has come back, and you have seen her. Tell me about it.' I gave him my story. "'That's Major Pearsall's house,' he said. "'Come back with me there at once.' "'But what can we do?' I asked. "'I've no idea. That's what we've got to find out.' A minute later, we were opposite the house. When I had passed it before, it was all dark. Now lights gleamed from a couple of windows upstairs. Even as we faced it, the front door opened, and next moment Major Pearsall emerged from the gate. He saw us and stopped. "'I'm on my way to Dr. Ross,' he said quickly. "'My wife has been taken suddenly ill.' She had been in bed an hour when I came upstairs, and I found her white as a ghost and utterly exhausted. She had been to sleep, it seemed, but you will excuse me. One moment, Major, said Urcom. Was there any mark on her throat? How did you guess that? said he. There was. One of those beastly gnats must have bitten her twice there. She was streaming with blood. And there's someone with her? asked Urcom. Yes, I roused her maid. He went off, and Urcom turned to me. I know now what we have to do, he said. Change your clothes and I'll join you at your house. 
What is it? I asked. I'll tell you on our way. We're going to the cemetery. He carried a pick, a shovel, and a screwdriver when he rejoined me, and wore around his shoulders a long coil of rope. As we walked, he gave me the outlines of the ghastly hour that lay before us. What I have to tell you, he said, will seem to you now too fantastic for credence, but before dawn we shall see whether it outstrips reality. By a most fortunate happening, you saw the specter, the astral body, whatever you choose to call it, of Mrs. Amworth, going on its grisly business, and therefore, beyond doubt, the vampire spirit which abode in her during life animates her again in death. That is not exceptional. Indeed, all these weeks since her death I have been expecting it. If I am right, we shall find her body undecayed and untouched by corruption. But she has been dead nearly two months, said I. If she had been dead two years, it would still be so, if the vampire has possession of her. So remember, whatever you see done, it will be done not to her, who in the natural course would now be feeding the grasses above her grave, but to a spirit of untold evil and malignancy, which gives a phantom life to her body. But what shall I see done, said I? I will tell you. We know that now, at this moment, the vampire, clad in her mortal semblance, is out, dining out, but it must get back before dawn, and it will pass into the material form that lies in her grave. We must wait for that, and then with your help I shall dig up her body. If I am right, you will look on her as she was in life, with the full vigor of the dreadful nutriment she has received pulsing in her veins. And then, when dawn has come, and the vampire cannot leave the lair of her body, I shall strike her with this, and he pointed to his pick, through the heart, and she who comes to life again only with the animation the fiend gives her, she and her hellish partner will be dead indeed. Then we must bury her again, delivered at last. We had come to the cemetery, and in the brightness of the moonshine there was no difficulty in identifying her grave. It lay some twenty yards from the small chapel, in the porch of which, obscured by shadow, we concealed ourselves. From there we had a clear and open sight of the grave, and now we must wait till its infernal visitor returned home. The night was warm and windless, yet even if a freezing wind had been raging, I think I should have felt nothing of it, so intense was my preoccupation as to what the night and the dawn would bring. There was a bell in the turret of the chapel that struck the quarters of the hour, and it amazed me to find how swiftly the chimes succeeded one another. The moon had long set, but a twilight of stars shone in the clear sky when five o'clock of the morning sounded from the turret. A few minutes more passed, and then I felt Urcombe's hand softly nudging me, and looking out in the direction of his pointing finger, I saw that the form of a woman, tall and large in build, was approaching from the right. Noiselessly, with a motion more of gliding and floating than walking, she moved across the cemetery to the grave which was the center of our observation. She moved round it as if to be certain of its identity, and for a moment stood directly facing us. In the grayness to which now my eyes had grown accustomed, I could easily see her face and recognize its features. She drew her hand across her mouth as if wiping it, and broke into a chuckle of such laughter as made my hair stir on my head. Then she leaped onto the grave, holding her hands high above her head, and inch by inch disappeared into the earth. Urcombe's hand was laid on my arm, in an injunction to keep still, but now he removed it. Come, he said. With pick and shovel and rope we went to the grave. The earth was light and sandy, and soon after six strikes we had delved down to the coffin lid. With his pick he loosened the earth round it, and adjusting the rope through the handles by which it had been lowered, we tried to raise it. This was a long and laborious business, and the light had begun to herald day in the east before we had it out and lying by the side of the grave. With his screwdriver he loosened the fastenings of the lid and slid it aside, and standing there we looked on the face of Mrs. Amworth. The eyes, once closed in death, were open, the cheeks were flushed with color, the red, full-lipped mouth seemed to smile. "'One blow, and it's all over,' he said. "'You need not look.' Even as he spoke he took up the pick again, and laying the point of it on her left breast, measured his distance." and though I knew what was coming, I could not look away. He grasped the pick in both hands, raised it an inch or two for the taking of his aim, and then with full force brought it down on her breast. A fountain of blood, though she had been dead so long, spouted high in the air, falling with the thud of a heavy splash over the shroud, and simultaneously from those red lips 
came one long, appalling cry, swelling up like some hooting siren and dying away again. With that, instantaneous as a lightning flash, came the touch of corruption on her face. The color of it faded to ash. The plump cheeks fell in. The mouth dropped. Thank God that's over, said he, and without pause slipped the coffin lid back into its place. Day was coming fast now, and working like men possessed, we lowered the coffin into its place again and shoveled the earth over it. The birds were busy with their earliest pipings as we went back to Maxley.